I was born into a multi-generational family that practiced, actively practiced satanic ritual abuse. And so from birth until 37 years old, I was accessed and utilized without really even knowing that that was what was going on with me. So from birth is when I was exposed to it. I was also exposed to and brought into it on a more organized level through the Mormon church. So my family were, were members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and also the behind the scenes underground organization of the blood cult that um, actually runs that church. And so through some, a series of um, some different testing, one of which was actually through me being on Romper Room. And so as the children on that particular show and me in particular, I can speak for myself, uh, were recorded and studied. From that, I was chosen by a high level member of the Mormon church who was actually in the highest level. There's a, what they call the general authorities. And then the first presidency is the president and his two counselors. So at the time it was a, a member that was actually in, was a general authority that did choose me to uh, be one of the children that he owned. And so I would be delivered to the church administration building in Salt Lake city and that would happen often. And that began when I was around five years old. And that continued until we were, we moved in, moved to Texas when I was in, I think it was 1980, 81 when that happened. So I was in um, ninth grade. So from about five years old to 14, 15 years old, I was being accessed and utilized by not only my family, and other people in the community or members of the blood cult community. I was also uh, part of rituals and ceremonies with the highest level of the Mormon church administration. Typical experiences could range anywhere from, I wanna say incest, uh, that would be in a familiar familial setting. So from incest uh, all the way to human sacrifice, um, I witnessed animal sacrifice. I was part of rituals where uh, children and um, teenagers and adults were ritually sacrificed and killed. I was made to drink blood. I was made to eat human flesh. I was also part of um, rituals that were specific to mind control, specific to uh, splitting me off, so creating multiple personalities. And that was something that didn't happen just in ritual settings. That was also something that was practiced um, at home in familial settings. I was put under testing, so it was kind of more of a mind control thing where um, different skills and levels and abilities um, that would be physical, mental, emotional, and uh, spiritual were also tested. And so I became uh, somebody that, you know, like they would record all of this so that they knew how to utilize me or what they would be utilizing me for based on those abilities, how I would be trained, what different personalities could be created that they could utilize, all of which would be uh, called up when they wanted to call them up if they chose to. I was unaware that I had the personalities, but I did actually have um, multiple personalities at one time until I did go through some extensive therapy, actually. Um, I witnessed um, in the family, I would witness uh, things that were there to reinforce the mind control training. A lot of times going to church every Sunday, the ceremonies and the trauma and the programming and the conditioning would be reinforced. So to give you an example, it would be like if I was going to be taking, you know, as part of the ceremony at the Mormon churches, you would be taking sacrament and the sacrament was taking, uh, drinking the blood of Jesus and, you know, taking the bread that would represent his blood or his, um, his flesh. And there had been ceremonies that I was a part of where somebody was sacrificed and I was told that it was Jesus and we would have to drink the blood and eat the flesh of the person that had been sacrificed. And so 
those kinds of ceremonies intentionally are focused and uh, created um, to further push those those uh, those traumas into a victim and into, in my case, into me. And then another thing that was uh, always present was a sexual violation. So typically it was a rape. That kind of violation pushes the um, the conditioning and the programming into the child even further. So they actually utilize very systematically and very mechanically, they utilize anal rape um, in order to um, drive in the programming and, and create multiple personalities. Vaginal rape is going to be utilized um, an intense amount of pain uh, in addition to be seeing um, really traumatic, terrifying events. There were um, experts that were doctors, um, a surgeon in particular, that would um, utilize surgical tools such as scalpels that would leave very, very, very small incisions that would not leave scars, that, but would also be very, um, very painful to remind you kind of like paper cuts. And every time I would, you know, like walk or I would bump that, that wound until it was healed, I internally and subconsciously would be reminded of the incident or the moment or the series of events that had happened to push in e even further that, uh, that trauma. So everything that is done is calculated, is planned, and is done in a way to maintain control um, of the victim. The, the ceremonies that I was a part of ranged anywhere from uh, my own home to uh, private residence, private properties, uh, church-owned properties. So the temples um, were places that this would happen at church houses. I even had ceremony um, at a Catholic cathedral. There were underground tunnels that I had um, experienced ceremonies in. There's private rooms, uh, cemeteries, even a university, there's underground um, uh, rooms, facilities, uh, connected places that the public isn't necessarily going to see. Um, it allows them to kind of move around and, and move victims around um, unseen and undetected. Uh, they would cross borders onto private land. So when I was affected in Mexico, we went from Texas into Mexico and that was the ceremonies that were done that was out on private land, out, out in the desert. Um, so there have been ceremonies where it's been on private land that it's been surrounded by trees. And um, even in stage settings where it would be like, although it was a private building, it was still like a theatrical set. Um, BYU is a place that I re you know, experienced some um experience some of the the trauma and the programming and also there was another university the university of utah um there was something that uh, some things that happened to me while i was there there was once i wouldn't even call it a ceremony there was an organized um there was an organized human trafficking sale that i was a part of and that sale was appeared as an event at the state fairgrounds and so where they would actually you know hold um large events this was at the fairgrounds in salt lake city and there were dignitaries from another country that were had flown in and uh, there were girls and i was part of it that were up on a stage and they would bid on us and then take us and rape us and then we go back up on this stage or we would be paraded in certain places and and part of that whole thing was um was just part of this human trafficking experience too so it wasn't necessarily a blood cult experience it was a definite trafficking um sale experience Complying comes along uh, with a lot of training. So for me, at least from birth, there are going to be some things that uh, that were employed through family or those who were handling me. One of the biggest things that was always present was uh, drugs. So I would be given a piece of candy or something to eat or drink, and I would always be in an altered state, which in addition to high fear, terror, trauma, and then also having instructions 
told directly to you or whispered to you, um, coupled with electric shock, coupled with, you know, watching a scene of somebody that you were told didn't comply being um, murdered in front of you. There was a number of different ways that all of this would combine to really uh, drive in an obedience and a certainty that you would not break the silence, that you would actually obey, that you would comply, whether you were conscious of it or not, because there was so much validation and evidence that was constantly there in front of you when you were in um, these traumatic experiences, that there's really nothing else that uh, you would want to do. There's always, it's always demonstrated that there's no way out. Um, and that the training, at least for me, was so thorough on not trusting myself, not trusting my own judgment, not and, and being shown that there was there was no way out either of the room or of who was controlling me, who the family members were. Uh, that that also reinforced it, and there was also very calculated and specific um, programming and conditioning against God. So even praying your way out of someplace, God never shows up or God is the one that is hurting you. That was demonstrated often where uh, somebody would pose as Jesus and I would be um, a victim to being brutally hurt or um, drowned almost to death. Um, and then the one that would end up rescuing me would be somebody that I would bond to, whether it was my handler or whether it was Lucifer. And so the dissociation with who I can really trust, even when it came to deity. I would say the top one out of these two is when we were in this, in this desert setting in Mexico. And it was um, what I believe was opening the border from Texas to Mexico for a particular kind of trade with a, with a, with a high dignitary group. And the man whose private property we were on had a, had a daughter. I, I believe she was a stepdaughter. And at the time I was about 15 years old and there was a number of uh, girls. We were trucked over. We were put in a, in a truck. It was very, um, it was created really brilliantly. We were in a meat truck. So the refrigeration truck, there were um, sides of beef. Um, that were actually near the back. So if they were ever stopped and they opened up the back, you could you could see, or somebody inspecting it could just see, oh, it's just a truck with sides of beef. However, the girls were near the front of the truck, of the trailer, and we were also all drugged, all passed out, and we were hanging in these sacks as well. So we would like could appear as these sides of beef as well. And so as we were deposited and dropped off in this place, they had um, they had created this really amazing, huge area with um, glamping tents and there was an altar there and there was a lot of activity there. But at the height of this dedication, I remember they had created a, a ceremony, there was chanting, they wore robes and they called the girl out this this daughter or stepdaughter out of the tent and she came out dressed all in white she was probably one of the most beautiful things i'd ever seen now and i was also under the influence of drugs too so it was it was there i was it was hazy but i was also very clear on what i was seeing and i remember her walking up to this altar and getting upon it all by herself and then at a certain point they handed her this gold dagger and she plunged it into herself almost like a self-sacrifice and that still within me that that was one of the that was so alarming that was so alarming that something like that in the way I was witnessing it what actually could happen and then they finished her off you know the the men that were standing there was three men that were standing like behind the this big stone altar that she laid herself on and I um I think maybe 
<clears throat> After all the ceremonies that I had seen and witnessed, there were more ceremonies that I could say had happened to a victim. <clears throat> but in this case, to see that she was clearly not herself, clearly in this daze, but clearly following through on these instructions, almost like she was on some kind of hypnotic, I don't know, I don't know what to call it. I've, I've actually since then researched and studied and found that there is a, there is a particular drug where that you would actually do whatever you were told and, and you couldn't, you, you can't, you can't deny it. You can't refuse it, even if it is to take your own life. And in my mind, that made sense to apply it here. But it still affects me. And later, by some kind of interesting turn of events, um, I found out through another victim who happened to be related to this man that owned that property because it's a Mormon community. And so this is years and years later, I found out that he did have a step, uh, you know, a, a, I think it was a stepdaughter that had died and they called it um, an accident that they, he and she were out riding the fence line in Mexico and uh, the horse got spooked and threw her and she was thrown onto a fence and impaled. And, and that's what everybody took as the uh, reason why she was killed and how tragic that was and how distraught he must have been and brought her back. When in reality, I witnessed one of the worst ceremonies I've ever seen in my, in my entire life or history through this. The message I would share with everybody is to really understand that your own self-led healing is the most important thing that you could possibly do. Get to know who you are, what it is that uh, is is uh, driving you, I guess. You know, we all have our own memories, whether we remember them or not. We all have our own traumas. They don't have to be as extensive as this, but you are worth it. You are worth doing this work. I became my own inner archaeologist and I have all my answers. I, I healed and have become the person I am now in such a more empowered place because I actually found the answers within me. And I watched myself just by getting these memories heal from them, not even going after whatever. I didn't even know I was going after, but the empowerment, the healing and, and the life changing um, life I'm leading now and experiences that I that I have in front of me and that I can look at behind me are just so much different because I took the time and I'm still continue to take the time to do my own self-awareness and self-healing. And so my message is you're worth it. My message is be your own inner archeologist, learn and do whatever you need to do to just be the most aware, most thorough, um, cohesive, person that you are and just know that it's possible if you have like multiple personalities like I did it is possible to have them be integrated and to be a sovereign be a person that is brought together um, as one you might hear that false memories are a thing you might hear that it's not possible to integrate you might hear that all you have to do is cope and that's not true I'm here to tell you that it is so possible to heal and to be really well um, adapted just by doing your own work. So I feel like it's worth doing. It's so important.